Hey guys, welcome to our service. Thank you so much for joining us. If you didn't know, Church on the Move has three locations across Northeast Oklahoma. We would love to meet you, so if you're close to one of those locations, come join us in person. We have incredible worship, teaching, and amazing kid and student environments, and I'd love for your family to experience that in person. If you have any questions, visit churchonthemove.com for more information or drop a comment below. Now, here's the service. Good day. How we doing? Oh, how we doing? All right, making sure, making sure. Man, I'm, I'm glad to be home and to be here. I've, had, I've been away the last couple of weeks, and a couple of weeks ago, I was in Michigan covering for a friend. There's a pastor that I'm in relationship with there, and he happened to be on a mission trip to Cambodia and asked if I'd come up and kind of take care of his place while he was gone. And it's good to, to be in other places and to experience the good that God's doing there. But man, it makes you appreciate home and being here with your family. And so I'm really thrilled. Uh, our team is, is so fabulous. And I just I love what God is doing here. And then last weekend, Kim and I got a chance to get away for three or four days. And um, we, were, we were thinking back, and it's been almost 10 years since her and I were just able to go somewhere, just the two of us, not attached to work or ministry or school or the kids or something. And man, it, I've had a couple of people say, well, what did you do? We did nothing. And it was wonderful. I, I told her, I was like, I feel really old right now because we're sitting on the back porch. It's beautiful weather. We're watching squirrels chase each other. We're literally watching the leaves on the trees change colors. And we're just having the time of our life doing nothing. And I was like, man, I feel so old. Um, but anyway, it was good and refreshing and, and relaxing. And during that time, I, it was just thinking back to what God has done here and what God is doing here. Thinking back to our journey, to our adventure over the last few years. And then just kind of started thinking about, okay, God, what have you been saying to us this year? What, what? Sometimes you can look back when God speaks to you and, and you can see the thread of, and, and get glimpses of what he's doing. And so I was just like, God, what, what are you, what have you been saying to us? And I, I just thought about the, the first few messages that we've taught throughout this year. And there's been a lot of how, there's been a lot of kind of instruction. The, the first series we, we tackled this year was how to be human. And looking at this question of, is, is there a right way, is there a wrong way? We really dug into the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is teaching us how to become the right kind of person and, and teaching us how transformation in our lives really happens, that it's not external, it's not from the outside in, but it's really from the inside out that God does something on us internally and changes the condition of our heart. And as those things begin to change, our, our behaviors and our actions and our external life begins to change as a result of the internal change of what God is doing. And then we jumped into a series after Easter about how to hear God's voice, understanding that God wants to be intimately and relationally connected to us and that he is a God that speaks to us. He's a God that leads us and guides us and we don't have to face the decisions or the unknowns of our life alone. We can have a leader, a, a voice, an advocate that helps us in those moments to know what the will of God is and the direction that we can go for our lives. And then uh, this summer we jumped into uh, not necessarily a how, but learning some major lessons from minor prophets and really looked at some books that a lot of us don't, didn't even know existed and, and didn't really know what was in there. And we've just found so much encouragement and challenging. We, we, we followed the journey of God's people as they refused to listen to God's voice. They refused to listen to God's instruction. And because of that, they got themselves in trouble. We know that they ended up in exile. And then the, this may be the greatest lesson that we've learned all year is that in the midst of their stupidity, God stayed faithful to them. And, and what an encouragement for us that even in times where we don't listen to God's voice, we get ourselves in, in trouble, God stays faithful, continues to pursue us, continues to be good to us, and continues continues to give us a future and a hope. And we saw that as God's people went into exile, God stayed faithful when they were there and, and brings them out and brings them back to their home. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And, and then the last few weeks, we've been talking about how to be married and looking at the, the dynamics of marriage and not just giving practical tips and tricks of how to improve your marriage, but really looking at what does a godly marriage look like? How do, how do you approach that? And what attitude do you approach it with? And, and really learning through that, not just how to be married, but understanding how God loves us and how God is faithful to us. So it's, it's been just a, a great year of, of listening and learning and 
You know, I, I want to talk today not so much about how, but about what, because what, what, I, what I really thought is, as I looked at this, is that God's up to something. God's at work here. I mean, you can't look back over the three years, three and a half years that we've been here and say, God's not doing something. Uh, God's changing people. He's building a family, building a community. God's at work here, building something significant. And he's doing it with you and with me. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter is talking to a church. He's talking to you and he says, I I want you to realize the significance of you being here and being a part of this. You are a living stone. Your life, your family, you are a living stone. And with this living stone, with these living stones that are being collected and, and, and gathered, God is building something significant. He's building a spiritual house. He's building a spiritual temple. He's building something of significance to where when God builds a house, he wants to dwell there. He wants his presence to reside there. He wants to show up and to do work. And I I just thought about this idea of building with stones, with building with living stones. I don't don't know if you ever built anything. As a kid, you had a pile of rocks and you were trying to maybe build your own wall or build your own fort and you had different rocks. Sometimes building with rocks is difficult. Because unless you are in manufacturing and you're building cinder blocks that are perfectly symmetrical, they're the same size, they're the same shape, they're smooth on all their edges, they've got the the grooves and the designs where you can put them together and and build something really great with these just manufactured, but but people aren't manufactured cinder blocks. They're they're more like walking out into the field. My father-in-law, he's he's got some property and he's amazed at the amount of rocks that he collects. He's like, I'm convinced that my land grows rocks. I didn't know there was such thing as rock farms, but but this place grows rocks. You can go out, pick up rocks. There's stacks and, and piles of rocks that we've picked up over the years trying to get it to where we can plow the ground, plant the seed, do the thing. And he's like, it's amazing. He has something called a rock rake that you hook up to a, a tractor and you pull along and it just makes a lot of noise, but it digs out the rocks and picks up the rocks. And we've got just, and you go back in it and there's more rocks. And it's like, where did that come from? I just picked that up. And, but the thing about the rocks out there is that they don't look alike. They don't, they're not shaped the same way. They're jagged, they're different sizes. And, and it's such a beautiful picture of living stones that we don't all look alike. We're different shapes, we're different sizes. And when you're building with, with rocks like that, one, you have to be very intentional of where you place the rock. You have to find the perfect place that it fits because of its unique shape, its unique design. And, and then secondly, uh, and I know God loves to do this with you and us, sometimes when you're building with these kind of rocks, you have to take a little chisel and a hammer and you gotta knock some rough edges off. And I just think that's maybe what God's been doing with us over the past three and a half years. He's just been slowly and faithfully building something of significance here where he's taking you and he's taking me and he's shaping us. He's knocking some of the edges off, but then he's just finding the perfect place, the perfect part of the community, the perfect place where we can serve and we can make a difference. And and he's building something of significance. And when I've thought about this idea of building, there's a lot of people in scriptures that build But there's been one person in particular that I've just been drawn to over and over. I've just been thinking about meditating on his story. That's the story of Nehemiah in the Old Testament. We just talked about how God's people were on a journey and they'd gotten themselves into trouble because they didn't listen to the voice of God. They get into exile, which means they've been removed from their homes. They've been removed from their cities. They've been removed from the place that God promised them and taken to a foreign land where they were turned into slaves. And after 50 to 70 years of being there, God moves and releases them. The the Persian king that was kind of in in charge said, you can go home. And so a large group of people returned home. There were some that stayed and Nehemiah's family was one that stayed. Now I want you to think about this. Nehemiah has grown up hearing about the promised land, having never experienced the promised land. He wasn't born in Judea. He wasn't born in Jerusalem, in the city of God, in the promised land. He was born in exile. He was born in Babylon. So the only thing that he's known is exile, is this foreign country that that I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I feel like I'm supposed to be somewhere else. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, but Nehemiah did. And even in spite of staying behind, Nehemiah was faithful and God continually promoted him. And he finds himself in a really powerful position right next to the king. He's the king's cupbearer which means he's protecting the king and making sure that nothing gets to the king that could hurt the king, poison the king. He's kind of the gatekeeper of who gets access to the king. He's in a really powerful position. But as he hears about and he knows that his people, his, his nation, his, his group is returning home, he is 
consumed with what's it like. I've heard the stories of the temple. I've heard the stories of the city. I've heard the stories of how God blessed Abraham and called us and chose us and gave us a place and a promise. And I, I wonder what it's like. I wonder if it's amazing. I wonder how the people are doing. They're probably ecstatic. They're probably happy. They're probably so thrilled to be home and to be in the place where God created them to be. And I, I bet the city's amazing. And so he, he asks a friend who's actually been there. And he says, I, I want to know how, how are the people who've returned home? And they said to me, they're replying to Nehemiah and they said, things are not going well. It, it's not what you dreamed of. It's not what you fantasized about. It's not what you've imagined. Things are actually pretty terrible. They're not going well for those who have returned to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and they're in disgrace. They're sitting in their defeat. They're sitting in their shame. They're living in the mistakes of their past. And they're just sitting in trouble and disgrace. They're, they're, they're not moving forward. They're not doing anything about being home and, and returning to the place where God's created them. The wall, the thing that protects the city, the thing that's assigned to everyone else, that, hey, there's life, there's strength, there's the movement of God here. The wall that protects them from the threats and the dangers around them, it's been torn down. And the gates that keep the wrong things out and let the right things in, the gates of the city have been destroyed by fire. And so this was not the report that Nehemiah is expecting. And so you wonder, what's his response to that? Well, he said, when I heard this, I sat down and I wept. His heart was crushed. His life was just, he was an emotional wreck. And he said, not just for a moment. It wasn't like, oh, that, that really moves me. No, for days, actually for almost four months, he mourns, he grieves the condition of people that he, he doesn't, intimately know, but there's something about, there's a connection here that he grieves, he mourns, he fasted, he did without food, and he just prayed to the God of heaven. And he just prays and he fasts and he mourns and he grieves. And I don't know if you've ever heard about an injustice in the world that wrecked you like this wrecked in Nehemiah. That you just like, man, this is wrong. This isn't right. This is how life was created to be. I, I remember as a kid, Growing up, and, and we were always in church, and uh, the doors were open. We were there, and one night we were going home from church. I think it was a midweek service. And I could overhear my parents in the, in the front of the car talking about some people that were going through some stuff. And, and it was some distant family relatives that I'd, I'd never met, didn't know. But uh, they're like, oh, that's a cousin. That's you know, some, some distant. And they began to talk about them having a miscarriage. And I, said, well, I didn't understand what that word meant. So I asked, I said, well, what is that? And as they began to explain to me what had happened, I remember just this overwhelming sense of this isn't right. How, how can we live in a life where that can happen when we serve a God who's so good? And I, I didn't make sense in my mind. I didn't have that framework to understand it. I remember going home and being so wrecked by this, by this injustice, that I just, it broke my heart. I, I cried, I was praying, I was praying for them. I didn't know them, but I was praying for them and praying for their, and I was, I was a little kid. And, and I, I love it, and I identify with Nehemiah in this way, but the danger is I've lost some of that. That as I've grown up and I've been exposed to more suffering and more hurting and more pain and more need, and it's just, it's everywhere. It's like in family members, it's in friends, it's on the news, it's here, it's there, and it's just like overwhelming the amount of trouble that exists in our world. And I think some of us, we, we were designed to have these kind of moments to where we experience something in the world that we know this isn't right. This goes against everything. This goes against the character of God. This goes against the kingdom of God. This goes against everything that I've been taught that is good and right about God. And this is, bro and man, something needs to be done. We are created to have those, but we can only have that for so many things. We, we can't, because here's what, here's what happens. What I've had a tendency to do is just shut down from the world because I can't handle, I can't, I can't watch the news, I can't see that hurt, I can't see that hurricane, I can't see that war, I can't see those people that are, I, we were not created to take in and process that much anxiety and stress and worry and brokenness in the world. We were created to be exposed to some of it because we were created to do something about it. And what Nehemiah is feeling and what you need to pay attention to when you are moved by something like this is, is 
be attentive that when there's an injustice and it moves you so much, it's probably that God is stirring. You need to do something about this. You need to get engaged with this and bring a solution. And that's what happens to Nehemiah. And, and because we don't respond correctly to these, we either shut down our life. It's like, I can't feel that. I can't. Because if, if we fell apart at every injustice, we'd just be a puddle and we'd be a mess and we'd be useless to anybody. It's like, I got to function. I got to live. I got to work. I got to have a family. I got to be somewhat stable and confident for my kids. And I can't just walk around worried about everything that's going on and everything that's broken in the world. So we shut down or we feel this responsibility. I got to fix it and I got to be a part of everything and I've got to do this and there's this injustice and this homeless and I, this initiative and this mission trip and this thing and I got to give here and I got to do. And we just destroy ourselves. Why? Because we're taking responsibility for everything. That's not our responsibility to do something about. And I, I, a couple of months ago, I, I found and stumbled across this prayer that I thought was so good. It's the liturgy for those flooded by too much information. And, and this is a gift to you. You can find it on cotm.info and, and the message tab and the notes and stuff, but, and we'll send it out. But it's by a, a guy named Douglas McLeavy and he writes such a beautiful prayer of how we should pray in these moments. And he says, in a world so wired and interconnected, our anxious our hearts are pummeled by an endless barrage of troubling news. It's just endless. There's always stuff coming at us and it's more than we can handle. We are daily aware of more grief, O oh Lord, than we can rightly consider. We're aware of more suffering and scandal than we can respond to, of more hostility and hatred and horror and injustice than we can engage with compassion. We, we're limited. We're, we're, we have a limitation. We can't do something for everything that we're exposed to. We're overwhelmed by it. But you, O oh Jesus, this gives us a place, a place of stability and a place of uh, rest. Where, but you, O oh Jesus, you're not disquieted by such news of cruelty and terror and war. You're neither anxious nor overwhelmed. You carried the full weight of suffering, the suffering of a broken world when you hung on the cross and you carry it still. You're still working. You're still moving. Your spirit is still engaged in the suffering of the world. You are close to the brokenhearted. When the cacophony of universal distress unsettles us, when we get overwhelmed by this, remind us that we are but small and finite creatures, never designed to carry the vast abstractions of great burdens. For our arms are too short, and our strength is too small. There's limitations to what we can do. Justice and mercy and healing and redemption are your great labors. God, you do this in the world. You're, you're a God of justice. You're a God of mercy. You're a God of healing. You're, you're the one that's bringing redemption. It's not my responsibility to fix everything. But listen, I can't disengage. I can't pull back and just say, well, you know, the world is God's and he'll do what he's, I'm just gonna live my, no, we have a role to play. And he says, and yes, it is your good pleasure to accomplish such works through your people, through your church. Your church has a mission. Your church has a responsibility to be in the world. But God, you have never asked any one of us to undertake more than your grace will enable us to fulfill. You have graced us and given us a capacity to do something, but we don't have to do everything. Guard us then from shutting down. There's so many of us in the church that have shut down. We've shut down our empathy. We've shut down that part of our life that gets wrecked when we hear about an injustice or, or something that's just wrong in our community, in our, in our immediate world. Guard us from shutting down our empathy and walling off our hearts because of the glut, the excess of unactionable misery that floods our awareness. Sometimes we're so aware of stuff we can't do anything about. I can't change that. I can't contribute to that. I can't fix that. But man, that is just wrong. Sometimes we're so aware of what we can't do anything that we miss an awareness of what we can do something about. He says, you have many children in many places around the globe. I'm reminded of Elijah who said, God, I'm the only one here who's serving. And God said, no, you're not. I've got 7,000 more. I've got more people than you know even exist that are doing and working and being faithful to me. And he, he says, you've got many children in many places around the globe. Move each of our hearts to compassionately respond to those needs that intersect our actual lives. There might be a moment today where somebody intersects your life and it's an injustice, something's going on in the world and God's created you and positioned you in that moment to do something about it. God, make us aware. 
so that we can be compassionate and respond to those needs that intersect with our actual lives, that in all places, your body might be actively addressing the pain and the brokenness of this world. That's our responsibility in partnership with God to be used by God to address the pain and the brokenness of this world. Each of us liberated. You've been liberated. You've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Your life's been changed. Your life's been transformed. You were made for something significant. You were not made to sit on the sidelines. You were not made to sit in shame. You were not made to sit in disgrace. You were made for something significant and you are a solution in God's hands to bring into the world to address pain and brokenness. Each of us liberated. Each of us empowered by your spirit to fulfill the small part of your redemptive work assigned to each of us. Give us discernment in the face of troubling news reports. Give us discernment to know when to pray, to know when to speak out, to know when to act, and when to simply just shut off our screens and our devices and to sit quietly in your presence, casting the burdens of this world upon the strong shoulders of the one who alone is able to bear them up. Amen. What a gift and what a pray, prayer just to say that, man, we, we need to just be aware of what God is doing and, and, and what God wants us to be a part of solving. There's so much going on and, and Nehemiah is broken over this. And as he weeps, he's realizing this isn't just something that affects me emotionally. This is something God's drawing me to, to be a, a source of a solution. I, I think there's something. I can't do everything. I can't fix all the problems. I can't rebuild the temple. I can't rebuild their homes. I can't fix the infrastructure. But something that I can do, something that I can be a part of, is I can help rebuild the wall. And so as he gets close to the king, the king asks him what's going on. And he says, listen, my, my, the people that have returned home, they're not doing well. And I feel this compelling to go and to be and to help bring a solution. Can I, can I go home and rebuild the wall? And the king gives him his blessing. So Nehemiah in chapter two returns. And before talking to anybody, he just does some inspection. He just inspects the wall and ex examines the damage and begins to get a list of here's what we're gonna need and, and here's how we need to go about this and here's the plan. And he just is inspecting. And then once he's gathered, he, he calls the people together and he says, now listen, you, you know the trouble that we're in. You, you know the disgrace that we're in. You know the condition of our city. But we were made for something more. Jerusalem right now is in ruins and its gates have been destroyed. But listen, we don't have to stay here. We don't have to sit here. We can move forward and we can rebuild the wall and put an end to this disgrace. We can change through what God is doing in us and what God wants to do through us. We can change the condition that we're in. And the people stand up and they respond, yes. We'll help you build. We'll contribute to this. We'll, we'll be a part of this. And so they go to work. And chapter three in the book of Nehemiah is just a list of all the people who are involved in building the wall. And it's talking about different families. And it names the family. It says they were responsible to build this section of the wall. And this gate they repaired. And, and this business showed up. And, and they repaired this section of the wall and the gates. And they were working here and they were faithful and diligent in their work. And I love it. One, one says a, a father and his daughters show up and they're building this section of the wall and doing the work and partnering with everybody. And there's the priests are showing up and they're building their section of the wall. And everyone in the community begins to show up, begins to respond, and it begins to build the wall. And chapter three is just a list of everybody who's, who's at work and how they're working and what they're doing. And they're faithful. They do it collectively. Chapter four, they start to hit some opposition and they start to have some people that are not excited that they're rebuilding this wall. And, and they're like, okay, we're, we're, we're under attack here. We've got some danger. We've got some opposition. We, we need a plan to protect ourselves. And you might think that, man, well, let's just stop building. And Eli says, no, we got to keep building. This is important. This is significant. Even in the face of opposition, let's keep building. Let's keep moving. Let's keep going forward. He says, but here's, here's, here's what we'll do. Let's get some to guard and some to work. And then we'll flip and, and you guard and you work when you, when, when you get tired and you need a break. And so, and some people, they were building with one hand and holding a weapon with the other. And they're like, we're just going to keep, but here's the thing. We're so spread out and everybody's involved in this that if we're attacked at a part of the wall, we're going to be vulnerable because they're going to be fighting a battle by themselves. Here's what we're going to do. When you hear the alarm, when you hear the trumpet sound, 
Be aware that there's an attack on a particular place in the wall and we're all going to rally to that point and we're going to defend and fight for that family, fight for those individuals. In chapter five, there's some squabbling going on in the community. They start to take advantage of each other. They start to mistreat each other. They're doing some things and, and Nehemiah gets in the middle of the business and says, listen, we're not going to treat each other this way. We're family. We're community. We're God's people. We're going to respect each other. We're going to treat each other with dignity. We're going to do what's right by each other. And so don't take advantage of each other lift each other up, encourage each other, move. And then in chapter six, we see that there's still some opposition, but they finally finished the wall. And he says in chapter 15, so on October the 2nd, the wall was finished. Just 52 days after we'd begun, this this seemed like an impossible task. This seemed like there was no way it was ever gonna get done or never get accomplished, but because everybody showed up and everybody did their part and they had some leadership and God was involved in the process, they did in such a quick amount of time, what seemed impossible. And it says, when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened, they were humiliated, and they realized the work had been done, not just by us, but they had been done with the help of God. God was involved in the building process. God was helping us build. And it just makes me think about what God is doing here and what God is building here. And I began to ask myself, God, what what is it? What is it that you're building What is it that you're working on? This isn't just a place where people are showing up. This isn't just a place where people are hanging out. This isn't just a social club where people are getting some social interactions and getting their social needs met. This isn't just a place where people are coming to learn. It's not just an educational center. Yes, they're learning. Yes, there's social interaction. This this isn't just a place where people are showing up to get entertained. Yes, there's sometimes laughter and there's things that we enjoy and there's there's those things, but but that's not what this is. That's not what you're building. God, this isn't, ah, what is it that you're building? And it was, it was just a simple reminder. It's like, duh, he's building a church. He said, well, what is, what is a church? There's different analogies that people use for a church. It's a business, it's a this, it's a that, it's a social club, it's a theater, it's a place of entertainment, it's a place of education. No, no, no. Here's what a church is. A church is the community. And, and you might even say family. Church is the community of God, the family of God. And it's not just a group of people showing up to, to love on each other. Yes, there's that. It's not just a group of people showing up to be encouraged. Yes, it's that. It's it's not just a group of people that are showing up to click their religious obligation and do their thing. It's people showing up that are the community of God who are on the mission of God. We are on God's mission. There's something that God's made us for. There's something that he's building. There's a reason that he's building. And it's for us to address the brokenness and the pain in the world in which we exist, in the communities in which we interact with. And we have a responsibility to build faithfully what God is building when I was wrestling with this, I was like, okay, God, um, what, what, kind of, what kind of community are we building? What, what, what do we want people, what, what do you want people to be able to say about Church on the Move West? What, what, do, you, what do you want us to build here? And, and, and there were some things that started to emerge. I think one of the most intentional things is that we have to build a trusted community. A community that's trusted. You, you have a conversation with someone and like, hey, do you, do you trust the church? I could have that conversation with a lot of you here and the answer would be, no, I don't. Why? Because in a lot of our lives, the church has been a source of hurt and disappointment. Why? Because the reason that is, is because the church often said the truth or said the right thing, but the difficulty was finding a church or church people that actually lived the truth that lived what they preached. It's one of the greatest frustrations for me to hear great messages and great sermons and have people that I respect in the kingdom of God and I love their teaching. And then I hear that their lifestyle doesn't match what they teach. It's frustrating. And it's hard to trust when there's not an integrity between what you say and what you do. And I'm not talking about being perfect, but what if our community was able to say about us, man, they don't just talk about it. They don't just preach it. They don't just learn it. They don't just read it. They don't just have a Bible. They live the Bible. They live the truth. Man, when that person says that they're gonna do something, they follow through. They're a person of their word. They're a person of character. They're a person of integrity. They don't just talk about forgiveness. They live it. They don't just talk about faith. They live it. 
They don't just talk about redemption and being redeemed and how God, there's actual fruit in their life that you can see the work of God in their life. And I know them. I know what they were like in high school. I used to work with them. I used to listen to how they talk. But man, now they don't just talk about God. I'm seeing God in their life, in the way that they live, in the way that they interact with people. The way they treat me is different because they're not just talking about the truth. They are living the truth. They are living the word. They are living and being led by the spirit of God. And I can see the difference and I can see the fruit of their lives. If we want to be a trusted community, we don't want to just say the right thing. I work hard to try to say the right thing, but I need to be as diligent about being and doing and living the right thing and living what I say I believe. And we want to become a trusted community, not just in this sense, but I love it in in chapter four of Nehemiah when he says, listen, we're under attack, we're in danger, but we're spread out. Listen, as a church, we're spread out. We got people that live here. We got people that live over there. We got people that live in this community. We got people that drive from an hour away to be a part of this community because they found something, that God is doing something here. And, and, And we're spread out. But man, I love it. He says, when somebody's in trouble, Let's sound the alarm and we can trust that the community is going to show up and defend us, protect us, walk with us through some of the hardest moments of our life. What if we were trusted? What if you were trusted? That you, you may not even know the person. Say, I, don't, I don't know them. I, they, they, they go to the Saturday at five and I go to the Sunday at 10 and I don't even, but, but if we find out that someone in our family has hit tragedy, is under attack, man, what if the alarm sounded and they knew I can trust that the church is going to show up for me. I know I can trust that people are going to, that something people I don't even know. I was, I was watching someone and this lady went through a catastrophe in her life. And she said, man, I, there were just people showing up from everywhere that were part of my church that I didn't, I didn't even know, but they just, they heard about it and they just responded. What if we were trusted to show up when part of our family was under attack? We're not just building a trusted community. We're building a safe community. You say safe for who? Safe for believers, safe for sinners, safe for the lost, safe for the doubters, safe for the critics, safe for the, for the, for people who are struggling with, I don't even know if this Jesus thing is for me. It's, it's a safe place for people to walk in and be a part of a loving community, knowing that we're not seeing you for who you are. We're seeing you for who you can be. And our commitment is that wherever you are, however good you are, however bad you are, we're going to love you the way that Jesus loved you. We're going to serve you with the love of Christ and with the integrity of Christ. And if you want to look where where some sinners felt safe, they felt safe with Jesus. And and they were struggling. They had questions, but it was a safe place. Jesus, you could ask him a question. You could express, I I don't know that I I believe that. I don't know that I agree with that. I don't know that my life reflects that. And Jesus would have conversations with you, but more than have conversations, he would display his love and his care and his compassion for you. And he was a safe space for you just to be you. There's this verse in John chapter four that says, Jesus says, you need to worship God in spirit and in truth. And I think there's a couple of dynamics to that truth piece. We need to worship God in the truth of who he is. And we need to continually learn who is God. What, what are you about? But there's also this piece of worshiping him in the truth of who I am. I don't have to come and be fake. If I'm struggling, I can, I can come in my struggle. If I'm succeeding, I can come in my success. If I'm in a good place, I can come in that good, I can come in the, pl- the truth of who I am. And know that God's going to meet me where I am and continue to move me forward into who he created me to be. If I'm in a a, a rough place, a troubling place, a disgraced place, a shameful place, I I love that line. I, I wasn't made to sit in my shame. I wasn't made to tend my grave. No, I was made for something more. I was made and and God is a safe place. The church should be a safe place to come in the truth and the reality of who I am. If I'm not okay, I'm not okay. And it's okay to not be okay here but it's not okay to stay there. We're not gonna leave you there. We're gonna love you. We're gonna serve you. We're not gonna judge you. We're not gonna criticize you, but we're gonna be honest with you. We're, we're gonna take you and we're gonna love you through God's word. We're gonna take you on a journey and say, hey, listen, this isn't, this isn't the right place. The, Nehemiah said, hey, let's not sit in our disgrace. Let's not sit in our defeats. Let's not sit in our mistakes. Let's not sit in, in what happened yet. Let's, let's build something 
And, and we're going to love you where you are, but we're going to help build you and move you and, and, and inch you into who God made you to be. It's a safe place. It's a safe place for people to take a risk. It's a, it's a safe place for people to serve for the first time. It's a safe place to show up to a Bible study and say, hey, I, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't even know this book existed. I thought it was the book of jobs. I, I was, you know, I was, uh, it's okay to not know. It's, it's, a, it's a safe place to, to say, hey, can, can you help me understand that? It's a, it's a safe place to show up and be part of the community. It's a safe place to lift your hands for the first time in worship. And maybe you've sat there and like, God, did I feel something on that? I, I want to, I, I never, it's a safe place to move in God's direction. Not only are we building a safe place, but we're building a charismatic community. And, I, and don't, lo- don't, don't lose me because it doesn't mean what you probably think it means. It doesn't mean banners and flags and modesty cloths and everybody speaking in tongues. The, 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 I, I, the root of charismatic, this is a biblical concept. And sometimes movements hijack words and we kind of dismiss words because of movements that misuse and do some things wrong. And we miss the good, we miss the gold and what it is. And the root word of charismatic is charis. It's the Greek word for grace. And we're, we're building a community that's dependent upon the grace of God. Ephesians 2 says we were saved not by our works. We were saved by the grace of God. And there's a part of this grace that is me receiving from God what I don't deserve from God. Salvation, forgiveness, purpose, dignity, value. I, 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 in my sinfulness, gave up my rights to those things. But God in his grace restored them to me and said, I, I, I see who I created you to be. And I'm gonna continue to move you in that direction. And by his grace, I'm saved. And every one of us, me and you, we need the grace of God. But we don't all, all just need the grace of God. We need to extend the grace of God to each other and to build a loving, gracious community because there's something, have you ever heard this phrase? Man, they really have a grace for this. And that guy, he just has a grace when he, he, to talk and to encourage. I mean, they, there's something about her that when she shows up, there's just a grace in her to help people in need. Grace is not only something we receive from God in the, in the fact of a gift we don't deserve, it's also an empowerment to do something for someone else that sometimes they don't deserve. And every one of us have a charis, a grace gift. It's called, again, Greek word charismata. It's the plural for spiritual grace gifts. And and 1 Peter 4 says this, he says, God has given each one of you, every one of you sitting right here, right now, you're a living stone that God is shaping, finding the perfect place for you. You are a grace, you have a grace gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them. Some of you are sitting there and you have a gift and you're not using it. You're sitting there and the wall's being built around you. The church is being built around you, but you're not contributing yet. Nehemiah, I love this. Someone said, well, where do you see charismatic in the story of Nehemiah chapter three, where everybody was showing up and realizing I have a responsibility to build my section of the wall. I have a responsibility. There's something in me that I can contribute to this. There's something that I can do. There's something that I can build. There's, there's, there's a section of the wall. And, and some of us are sitting there and the, the church is being built around us and we're not using the gift that God's put in us. And listen, there's not people standing out waiting for you to come out that are signing you up for a team. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. Yes, do that, please. We need more help in all of our areas of ministry. But this is about you realizing what has God put in me that can build the person next to me. There's something in you that the person sitting next, you sat by them. God intended for you to sit by them today. They may need your encouragement. They may need something you say. They may need your smile. They they might need you to hug them. They might need you just to listen to them. They may not need you to touch them. They may need you to just keep your distance, but listen to them, whatever it is. But there's something in you that God wants to use to build the people around you, those needs that intersect with your life. And some of us have shut shut it off. We don't see the gift. We don't acknowledge the gift. We don't know the gift is there. We're ignoring the gift. We don't care. We're just showing up. We're doing our thing. We're we're doing our church time. We're doing our religious duty. And you're missing. Use the gift that God's given you. If you have the gift to speak, and it's not just this kind of stage communication, but sometimes you are gifted to speak into the lives of people 
in ways that they need to hear wisdom and knowledge and encouragement. There's something you can say that no one else can say in a way that you can say it that God's put in you that can change the life of someone. He says, if you have the gift to speak, then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Whether it's listening to them or encouraging them or, or helping them practically in some kind of struggle in their life, do it with the grace of God, with the strength and the energy that God supplies then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. You you have a gift. And it's not just me. It's not just some of the staff that's building. It's not just God. It's us building together. And guess, guess what? If we'll build a charismatic community where everybody realizes I'm, I'm responsible for this place, I'm responsible to show up and to, to be a part, guess, guess what happens? We, we start building a safe community. Why? Because everybody's seen, everybody's valued, everybody's loved, everybody's served, everybody's encouraged, everybody's getting their needs met. Why? Because we're building the community of God's people on God's mission of building the lives of the people around us. Guess guess what happens if we build a safe community? We'll build a trusted community. What if it's that you you, you go there, you're going to get loved. You you go there, you're going to encounter God. You you go there, they're, they're not just talking about it, they're living it. Because everybody there realizes they were gifted by God to show up and contribute to building a healthy church. Father, I thank you that you're building something significant here. You're moving, you're shaping, you're knocking the rough edges off the living stones. And you're helping us realize what you've placed on the inside of us, the spiritual gift that exists there. So Father, today, if if nothing else, I, I I, I pray that you help us understand what you're building And that we have a responsibility, we have a contribution to help build it, to help do it. It's us in this together, in partnership with you and your Holy Spirit. And I thank you that in the years to come, we're going to continue to see lives changed and people move towards you and people loved and forgiven and restored. We're going to see those that are broken and filled with disgrace come in and experience the hope of Jesus Christ. That their life would be radically changed. God, would you give us a heart for people? When we encounter, when our life intersects with injustice, would you give us the heart of Nehemiah that would be broken for what people are experiencing and going through? And that we would, in those moments, I just feel something, but like Jesus, be moved with compassion to do what we are capable of doing. We love you, we honor you, and I thank you for this church family. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Would you stand with me?